Well, put your hands together, saints. Welcome. We welcome you in the name of Jesus right now. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, my goodness. Are you, re are you hungry today? I hope you are. I hope you're ready to feast. I've got a wonderful, wonderful word today. I just want us to settle for a moment, though, because the presence of the Lord is here today in a very tender way, very precious way. And it's always good to acknowledge his presence, isn't it? Thank you, Lord Jesus. We welcome you, King of our lives, King of our hearts. We bow before you, mighty one. We bow before you, Lord of all, King of all kings, Lord of all lords. We surrender as your children, as your lambs, Lord. We hunger and thirst after your righteousness, Jesus. We seek you. We seek to honor you, to bless you and to bless your precious ones, Lord. Give us your love today. Give us your Holy Ghost today, Lord. Heal our hearts wherever they need touching and mending, O God. You are the mender, Lord. You split the nets with fruitfulness, and you sink the boats with fruitfulness, and we invite you, precious Holy Spirit, to bring such healing and fruitfulness and blessing to us today in Jesus name someone say amen put your hands together again I might have to shout amen let me read a, a beautiful text from John chapter 4 verse 4 now he had to go through Samaria so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well, and it was noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, Will you give me to drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did so his sons and his livestock, Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you just said is quite true. <laughs> Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place where we worship is Jerusalem. And the woman, woman Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor at Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and is true and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he has come, he will explain everything. Jesus said, I, the one speaking to you, am he. 
Oh, my. Just then, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat of that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him that sent me while it is day and to finish his work. Verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay two extra days. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. May God bless the reading of his holy word. It was the Samaritans, the outcasts, the renegade men, women, boys, and girls who had mongrelized the Jewish race that came to an understanding that Jesus was the Savior of the world not just of a strict denomination, not of any one narrow nationality, not locked in any box or any drawer, but that he was the Savior of the world. And Jesus opened the lid of his heart and revealed, first of all, that he was the Messiah. First time he's ever said, I that speak unto thee am he. And he says to them, he doesn't call him the God of Israel, doesn't call him the God of your fathers, the mighty God, the almighty God. He says, your father. He is God and father of all. Not just Jews, not just Levites, not just priests, not just whatever your little group is, bless us for and no more. But whatever box you have, you find an empty box because Jesus always jumps out of your box. He ju you can't box him in. You can't, you can't fit him into your specific doctrinal spectrum alone because he jumps out. Behind this encounter with this precious woman is a vision of the worship that God accepts and that God seeks. And it is not, it's not predicated on place or certain relics or any one location, but it is literally no tradition, but in spirit and in truth alone, because God equally and everywhere, whoever will, can receive, because he's the Savior of the world. Did you know that God loves you and your group, but he loves everybody else that's never seen your group, doesn't know anything about your group? Now, last week, we began a, a series called Jesus in a Racist Culture, and we looked for a moment at the root causes of this tension that we see in John chapter 4, and it is a huge tension. And whenever you run into a racist tension, and then when, whenever you run into where people want to bait you into political arguments, you're always going to be dealing with some degree of human hatred and tension. And last week we pointed out that in 722 BC, when the north, 10 northern kingdoms, the 10 tribes to the north, were taken into Assyrian captivity, the land was re sown with Babylonians 
and with pagans. And the few people that were left in the north intermarried and intermingled with all of the pagan peoples and the idol worshipers that were brought in. And they literally gave birth to the people hated in the time of Jesus known as the Samaritans. You couldn't think to a Jew of pure stock and pure descent anything more contemptible than the origin of the Samaritans. Their view of scripture was wrong. Their view of biblical history was wrong. Jesus actually says, by the way, you guys don't know what you're talking about. When it comes to, they only took the five first books of Moses, the Pentateuch. They rejected all the rest of the Old Testament. They believed only in certain relics and specific locations that were in a certain part of the land in Samaria, but they poo-pooed everything else. Anything that came from the house of David, nothing. Worthless. And so they, they would pick and choose their view of God was faulty, their view of theology was faulty, their view of the Bible was faulty. Just pretty much Jesus said, everything you folk believe is wrong. But God loves you. Do you know how much of your theology right now is technically wrong? right now. I'm still sitting with you. Mike's still sitting with you. God bless Mike. Did you know how wrong you are right now? Just wrong on so many front, politically and otherwise. Just opinions you formed through osmosis, the brother of Moses, and just sort of put it together, and you've just always believed that way in this family, and you're wrong. You know, if you ever stop to think how wrong you are in so many areas right now, I think only then would you realize how loved you are, how desperately and lavishly loved you are by the Father. Because the Father doesn't look down and just see the Levites and the priests and the denominations and all these folk. He sees everyone. And he loves all of his precious children, despite their pedigree, where they've been, what they've done. Now, now, now of course, you think you're very liberal. Of course you do. You think you're very liberated. You think you're very forward thinking. But you know what? You have boxes right now. You can see narrow. You're so narrow minded you could see through a keyhole simultaneously with both eyes in some area. We just have to press it and find your little tick tock. We got to find your little thing you know my favorite preacher one of my favorite preachers that I've ever sat under all my life he had a little tick he couldn't do his sermon without mentioning something against the rapture it was just his thing you could never hear one sermon that he taught that he didn't make some comment about the wrath and those of you in your robes up there on the hill waiting for the rapture i don't think i have much to say to you you know and we all waited for it because it was always there you just had to get it along with everything else <laughs> come on we all have a few little baggage here and there that people just sort of roll their eyes for a moment to get what my kids do well, they're, they're, everyone can be wrong. But um, I want you to notice what this, G, this, this, this young lady, Jesus confronts her morally. And he says, uh, sweetheart, you're not kidding. You're, you're not married. I mean, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And she immediately tries to change the subject. Do you ever try it when Jesus gets moral with you, when he starts getting a little bit too close? Do you ever try to change the subject to something theological? She's sitting at, at, at Jacob's well, and he's sitting there too, and she goes, you know, you got five guys now, and, you know, I don't know anymore. You, you know, and she goes, oh, look at that mountain over there. 
<laughs> it's called Mount Gerizim. It's the big mountain right there by Jacob's well. You can see it to this day. She goes, um, Jesus, and she brings up the hottest political theological point that divides the Samaritans from the Jews. She figures, I got to get the light off me real quick. This is getting hot. So she brings up a big hot, brings up a Democrat Republican issue. Bring up Trump. They're talking about Trump, right? Because you're going to, you, you, you're trying to get the light off you. That's a good thing to do. And so she brings up Trump. She brings, she goes, you know what? You know, the, 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 the biggest area of disagreement theologically Jesus that all you rabbis know about is whether we're to worship at this primitive shrine over here in Samaria Mount Gerizim where we Samaritans worship or that illegitimate enterprise you guys have going in Jerusalem with Herod's temple over there killing all those animals and oh what a waste of time you're a bunch of heretics so she tries to throw this theological topic down before Jesus to do what it normally does which gets the whole room fighting like a bag of cats and she says you know Jesus um, I mean which mountain again is legitimate for us to worship at Jerusalem or here in Mount Gerizim and Jesus, as always, gives a revolutionary answer. He says, neither, honey, neither Mount Gerizim nor Jerusalem ultimately matters. What? Every Samaritan would go, what? Every Jew would go, what? See, everything Jesus did always had to get into the mix. He would always, he, he never argued. He would never fall into racist or nationalist discussions, ever. You can't find him once engaging in the political debacles of the day. But what he would do is he would say, you know, there's coming a day when your sincerity in worship is going to be more important than the place of worship. When your sincerity and purity of heart is going to mean more. And such worship is what the Father seeks. He loves his babies. He loves them to be sincere. And Jesus just steps in and sidesteps all the political arguments. I wish you could do that. I wish you had a brain. But I hear Christians doing it all the time. <laughs> just the devil. All he's got to do is come in and just throw anything in a room and you'll go right with the bag of cats. <laughs> You're gone. And we all just sort of muse and God is the father of all. And, and, and then she says, well, yeah, you know, I know this is a deep topic. And, uh, you know, one day the Messiah will come. And he says, honey, I am the Messiah. The father of all who loves you, who I just told you about, is here right now. And I'm the Messiah who loves all. And I'm going to die for all the world. I just jumped out of your box and I'm here at Jacob's well. Oh, beloved, can we jump out of the box and seize the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls? Can we not fall into political, political drivel and nonsense and immaturity and baby conversations? And could we just seek the hearts and minds of men, women, boys, and girls? Could we be like Jesus? Offend every group put off every group and let them know again the Father loves all of them. All of you. Wherever you've been, 
whatever you've done, whatever your pedigree, whatever your past. Well, you don't know where I came from. Yeah, I do know where you came from. The Father doesn't care about boxes. He jumps out of every box. And by the way, they want to kill Jesus. This wasn't slight disagreement. They wanted him dead every time he opened up his mouth because he dared to defy human convention. He dared to defy religious opinion. When it was wrong, he would not stand in favor of it. And he didn't care what you thought of him. And he didn't care. He knew you were going to kill him. He knew everybody was going to torture him to death on the cross. It was just a matter of when. And he was in charge of when that happened. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I can take it up again. So don't think you can crucify me one second before it's time. But until that time, he is constantly sharing the love of the Father with every outcast. But the Samaritans of all, they were the ones that didn't fit anywhere. They didn't even know where they fit. They were so screwed up as a group of people, they didn't even know what their value was. And Jesus has a heart for them. Isn't it something? He loves the Samaritans. All through the New Testament, he keeps mentioning the Samaritans. This is not a group of folks that you were to bring up in conversation. But Jesus did over and over again. Jesus just reached right in the center of the stoking hatred of his time, and he would just poke around till everybody started growling and screaming. And, And then he would throw them all off by not taking any of their points of view and saying, you know, have you ever thought that God may love the Samaritan lady there as much as he loves your child that you adore? No, the Jews had never considered that. That God was the Savior of all? No, the Jewish brethren had never considered that as a possible option. Jesus said, Consider it because your father loves everyone and I'm the Messiah and I love everyone and I'm dying on the cross for everyone, every moral blemish, every cultural mistake, everything that you have no control over fixing in you. I'm dying for you too. Well, now Jesus don't go dying for them. Here goes the neighborhood. What is the group that you just will not allow God to touch? Oh, wait a minute. What is the group that you would never under any circumstance allow God to use in ministry? What are the, who are the Samaritans in your life, beloved? Now you've gone too far, Pastor. Undo your top button. You, even you need to breathe. Yep, gone too far. Who would you never on a month in a month of Sundays believe Jesus would ever cross the street to redeem or deliver or to save? That is who he wants to send us to. Wow, it's getting awkward. Yeah, it always gets awkward with Jesus because he has no boundaries. He has no limits. He has no structure that would keep anyone bound and anyone lost. He wants everybody. He wants them all. And he wants to use them all as instruments of mercy and healing and deliverance. Even the Samaritan. Did you know she came to the well at noon, the sixth hour? Did you know Jesus showed up at the well at noon at the sixth hour? No one went to the well at the sixth hour. But she went there so she wouldn't be subjected to the gossip and the gaze of all the other women who hated her for her history. 
Jesus knew exactly where she was and he showed up and he sent the disciples in to buy food because he had to get them the heck out of the way because they would have interrupted everything the father was trying to do. He was trying to love and redeem the life of a Samaritan woman and thereby all of Samaria. Did you know in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 6, there the Bible talks about a revival that breaks out in Samaria, in this very place where the Lord Jesus spent three days. Years later, Philip the Evangelist goes to Samaria. There are signs and wonders. And did you know the Bible says with great shrieks, demon spirits came out of people who were delivered from them. And it was such a row, it was such a revival that they had to send Peter and John, two luminaries from Jerusalem, to go down and vouch for this thing. Do you believe God is going to do things in our time that are going to look suspicious? He's going to start doing healings that seem a little squirrely and weird. He's going to start reaching people groups that uh, we don't want them hanging out in our churches. And like Chuck Smith used to say, you, well, you can, he said, you can, they said, well, what are we going to do with these hippies? dirtying up the, the carpet. He said, rip it out. Rip it out. We might have to rip out some carpet so that we don't offend some church folk. See, whenever Jesus starts stirring the pot like this and he starts doing things like the revival at Samaria, they got to send the big guns down to verify it just because we don't want to get into error and we don't want God reach into some group now that we've never seen him touch before and we're not quite sure what to do with meetings that get a little out of order. I don't know about you. I want some out of order meetings again. I want to see some meetings that are way out of order. The Holy Ghost can come and do what he wants to do and no human will can restrain it. Ooh. I hope you love Samaritans. You know, Jesus puts up with people that we can't stand. We can't stand them. They're quirky and they're odd and they're unique and they're strange and they don't fit in. They don't know where they fit in. And he'll use them to do signs and wonders in a city that will shake the city up so much that the apostles have to go down and vouch for it. We've got to make sure this is legit. I love that edge where we have to eat the hay and spit out the sticks. Isn't that lovely? Aren't you excited about God doing something like that? When the glory starts moving and some people say, I don't know, is it God? Is it the devil? There was an old uh, healing evangelist a few hundred years ago. And he was preaching in one of his services out in the lawns and people started falling down on the ground and oh my God, they didn't know what it was. And, and uh, two women fell down, a man fell down and they said, pastor, is it God or the devil? He said, well, whoever did it will get the glory for it. And they waited and they woke up and went, praise God. He said, it's God. Have you ever read the history of revival? Things get messy. I won't have a messy house. Well, if you don't have a messy, you're not going to have a messy stall, then um, you're not going to have anything. Because when you get animals that pull an awful lot of weight, they poop an awful lot too. So whenever you get any big animal, you're going to have to get poop along with the burden, along with the labor. It's going to get messy. Well, I don't like that. Well, good for you. That's why God usually has to move in other parts of the world because he doesn't have to ask for your permission. Mm -hmm. I've seen signs and wonders. I've seen God move in Africa. I've seen power, the power of God in Nigeria. I've seen Bible miracles. 
and uh, our limited groups over here go, well, it's just the devil, just, just making you think it's the Holy Ghost. Well, beloved, I don't know what your devil view is, but your God view has to be right, but your devil view has to be right too. There is no risk of Satan taking glory from the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah begins to run and move, it's not able to be counterfeited by the devil. Sorry. Praise his name. So, Lord, break through our walls. Where am I holding you back? Why? What won't I hear you say? What, what won't I obey you in? What? Who won't I talk to? What group have I written off? I was meant, I was uh, discipled by one of the greatest uh, theologians of our age, and uh, he was very strong in dealing with cults and occult, countercult ministry, and so on and so forth. And I mean, we we got so frightened of cults sometimes we'd run and hide in our house and shut the door and lock the house. Loved one, we don't need to be afraid of anything. The devil needs to be afraid of us. We go in the highways, the byways. We're like the Father. We love them all. We're like Jesus. We're going to give ourselves to them all. We're not going to set our limits and our boundaries, and we're just going to say, come on in, everybody, come on in. Well, what's going to happen? Well, glory is going to happen. Revival is going to happen. And God will make sure that you get the grace that you need to survive. But it's time for us to put down all the walls. Lord, right now, Lord, if there is any internal resistance in us to anything your spirit is prompting, anything that your spirit is guiding, anything that your word reveals to us, Lord. If there's any groups we won't talk to and that we're prejudicial against, Lord, that you would you would convict us right now of, of our Jewish Samaritan tension in us right here, right now. Whatever it is, if it's against any group, if it's against any moral issue, if it's against any certain sin, Lord, show us our own strictures and our own walls that we built and our own limits that we've imposed upon you and your very word that keep us in a little locked space where we can't access, like living water, the freedom and the washing and the touching of everyone everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. And we ask that you open us up, Lord, like the free living waters, Jesus, that touch everyone and quench the thirst of everyone and go everywhere. Water that goes over all of the restrictions and all of the walls. And we ask, Lord, that you would make us break through men, women, boys, and girls who can go anywhere bringing your life and your love, Father. Thank you for being the Savior of the world, Jesus. We declare you are the Savior of the entire world. In our time now, as you were 2,000 years ago, someone say amen. Oh, beloved Oh, beloved, he's breaking our chains, you see. Until he breaks your chains, it doesn't really matter who, uh, whose other chains are broken. You have to say, I belong all of me to all of you, Lord. You have to say, God, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Make me your instrument. And whether it's at the market or whether it's at wherever it is at your place of work, 
God may just have you turn your light bulb on and just shine the light of God's love and the Father's mercy and the Messiah's everlasting love and arms around them. Just wherever you go, they see the love of God in you and they see all limits destroyed. Whenever you come in, whenever your laugh is heard, whenever you offer an opinion, they, they receive the water of life, not some little argument even sounds irritating versus the cascading of the living water there's something delicious about a fountain about a well amen father i i pray right now that your presence would come upon every one of your precious ones right now that are here under the sound of my voice, Lord, that they would feel the tenderness of your embrace, that they would feel your infinite acceptance, that they would feel the Father's heart for the whole world, and that we would be somewhat, just a smidgen like you this week, Lord. Expansive, open, flowing like the waters of the well without limits and restrictions in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We, we appreciate you. If we feed you, would you please feed us? That would be just be such a divine thing. If you just sent some, an offering in or a tithe, or maybe you included us in your giving only if we feed you, we ask that you would feed us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I just want one more moment here. If we could just linger. Just linger with me for a moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Beloved, whatever you need right now, I pray that you would receive a tender touch from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That he would come up behind you and that he would just gently touch you with a touch of affirmation, love, to remove anything that would block you from the deep, effervescent sense of his love, his well of water for you. How much he forgives you, how much he forgives you everything, how he understands everything, and sets you free of everything so that you can be his beloved son or daughter. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.